Good morning and welcome to Health Talk, sponsored by Mon General Hospital. This program is designed to provide education on vital health topics to help you take charge of your health. You'll also be introduced to Mon General's committed physicians, allied healthcare professionals, and quality programs and services. And now, here are your Health Talk hosts, Kay Murray and Jim Stallings. Yes, Kay and Jim and Health Talk brought to you by Mon General Hospital. Good morning, Kay. Good morning, Jim. And our guest in the studio this morning is Janet Ween, a registered respiratory therapist and RN in the Richard Rosenbaum Pulmonary Rehab Center of Mon General Hospital. Say that again one more time a little faster, please. <laughs> no, thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Good, Good talking morning. to you here. Today we're talking about COPD and other lung disorders. And I think by now most of us have heard that acronym COPD, but what does that stand for? COPD stands for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. And it is by far the most common breathing difficulty that we see in pulmonary rehab. It basically consists of emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. Now, some physicians still put asthma in that category and others don't. But basically, it's a breathing difficulty where you have problems getting the old air out and therefore have trouble getting a new breath in. And who's more likely to develop COPD than anybody else? Well, the major risk factor for COPD is still smoking. Um, There's also occupational um, problems with this, environmental problems, and there's a small factor of um, individuals who have a genetic predisposition to specifically an emphysema type of COPD. Um, Smoking is more common now in women, so actually women have started to exceed men in new diagnosed cases of COPD. In fact, um, in a recent survey that was done by the CDC, um, there it was a large phone survey. It was about 500,000 people, and it, they interviewed people from all 50 states. And it's um, a technique that's called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. And again, it was a phone survey, and they were asking individuals about different health problems that they had. And the survey that was done in 2011 was the first time that anyone had ever been asked about COPD. Mm -hmm. So in 2012, when those statistics came out, that was the first real information that we had that we could see how prominent the problem really is. And it was broken down state by state. Um, West Virginia actually does rank within the top seven states of having COPD. But actually, the number one state is Kentucky, and number two is Alabama. It does seem to be more of a problem um, in the southern and Midwest states than otherwise. Is smoking higher in those states? Yes. And there's actually a correlation also um, between economic status. Um, It seems like individuals who um, are in a lower economic status also have higher incidences of COPD and don't have as much access to help with that problem specifically early on. It's currently estimated that about 24 million individuals in the United States have COPD. And about half of those haven't really been diagnosed yet. They know they have a problem, they're short of breath, but they haven't you know, gone to a physician to find out that they truly do have COPD. It's the third leading cause of death in the United States, and it's getting close to being the fourth leading cause of death among adults in the world. Being Kentucky and West Virginia and knowing how my father suffered with this, would black lung or working in the coal mines have anything to do with it? There, there are occupational exposures, you know, that, that do make a difference. Um, and certainly individuals who are in the workplace and are exposed to any type of lung irritants, um, whether it's the coal dust, uh, people who work in garages and they're exposed to fumes, other industries where there's irritation Um, for the airways and the air sacs within the lungs certainly are at higher risk, and specifically if those individuals also smoke, Mm -hmm. which seems to be common. And so many of them do for some reason. A lot of the coal miners do smoke. Right. And what ends up happening with the process of COPD is um, there's when we take a breath in, that air goes down through our airways and travels into our air sacs, and it's at that point that the oxygen leaves the lung and is picked up by the bloodstream so that it can be carried to the parts of the body that need it. And with specifically chronic bronchitis, there's been a constant irritation 
an inflammation within those airways, and that causes a chronic cough, um, a thickening of the airways themselves, which of course makes it harder to get the air in and out, and mucus production. And so when you're having a lot of thick mucus in there that you're having difficulty bringing out, that only adds to the shortness of breath. What is it that causes death? Well, generally it's, you know, COPD is a chronic condition. It, once you've been diagnosed with COPD, you will always have that diagnosis. And usually it's just an ongoing process as we have the deterioration within the, the lung function. Um, we also can develop heart problems when you have COPD because specifically if the oxygen levels start to drop, it puts undue stress on our heart. So it's not unusual that you can see people having heart disease along with the lung disease that they have. When you have emphysema um, within COPD, that affects the air sacs, the, the part that is responsible for helping getting the oxygen into the body and the old waste products or primarily the carbon dioxide out of the lungs. And the, the air sacs should be kind of like a balloon. You know, they inflate when we take a breath in and then close back up somewhat. They don't close up completely when we, take, when we let that air out. And that's what helps us maintain the proper oxygen ratio and, and getting a good breath in. But there's a destruction within that elastic wall of um, the air sacs when you have emphysema. And it allows those air sacs to become floppy and they hold too much old air in there. And most of the time when people feel like they, you know, just can't get a breath in, the real reason they feel that way is because the lungs are keeping too much of that old stale air within there, and we need to work on getting that out. But it, actually, it's just a progression. You know, you start to develop um, more significant lung disease. You can't keep your oxygen levels up. Um, recurrent infections. You, the lungs become weakened. Your immune system can't help keep up, and you end up possibly with a severe pneumonia or go into respiratory distress and then possibly heart failure. As Kay was remembering her father with COPD, my mother also had COPD, and I'm trying to think of the progression. I know she was a longtime smoker, but it seems to me she had um, congestive heart failure first and then was treated for COPD. Does that sound right? She could have. It can work, you know, either way. And certainly not everyone that has congestive heart failure ends up with COPD, nor does everyone that has COPD end up with heart failure. And that's one of the, the big keys is trying to get early diagnosis. You know, talking about women, um, more women are starting to develop COPD. It's actually 6.7% of women as opposed to 5.2 of men, according to this most recent that survey. That surprises me. It is. And one of the reasons is women didn't used to smoke or they didn't smoke publicly. You know, years and years ago, you just didn't do it. And now more women are smoking and they start smoking at a younger age. And also more women are out in the work force, you know, and they may be in jobs such as in the mines or in factories, um, you know, places where there's particles, you know, floating around that they are inhaling. Um, I mentioned also, you know, there can be environmental um, problems as well. People who live in areas where there's more pollution tend to have higher rates of COPD. Um, and I also mentioned the genetic factor. Um, but with all the education that we're giving these young people today, and you say more women, more young uh -huh. girls are smoking, back when I was a young girl, we you didn't hear about all the education and all the damage that it did, and we didn't smoke as much. Why are we not reaching these young people to make them understand what it's going to do to their body? Well, and there certainly is a lot of education out there now. Yes. And there's a lot of programs now going into the school system. Um, several years ago, they were targeting, like, junior high age and older um, high individuals school. in high school. And they found out that actually they need to start that a little younger because, you know, when you're in junior high and high school, that's when you want to be rebellious. So when someone tells you not to do it, you want to do it. If you hit kids at a younger age, you know, in like second grade, third grade, they're very concerned about their health. They're afraid that something's going to happen to them or to their parents. They want, don't want their parents to start smoking. So it, um, they're starting to put that into the younger school age children in hopes that that will have a better response. Surprising. 304-296-0041 is the show number. If you have any questions or want to uh, relate an experience with COPD or other lung diseases, pick up the phone and give us a call. This is Health Talk on WAJR, brought to you by Mon General. 
This is Mon General's Health Talk, providing the information you need to take charge of your health. Call us now with your health-related questions at 304-296-0041. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Janet Ween is our guest, a registered respiratory therapist at RN and the Richard Rosenbaum Pulmonary Rehab Center of Mon General Hospital. I'm Chip Stalling. <laughs> <laughs> so My air well. sacs weren't... Are you short of breath now? <laughs> My air sacs weren't blowing up correctly there, I don't He's, think. He doesn't smoke, so yeah. what does that say for you? I think it's just, You say some people don't realize that they do have this disease? That is correct. You know, they know something's wrong. They're short of breath. You know, the, the key symptom for COPD is shortness of breath, specifically with activity initially. Mm-hmm. But as the disease progresses, you start to become short of breath with your day-to-day activities, and then it progresses to being short of breath all the time. Um, you know, shortness of breath is one of those things, if we stop and rest, if, if it's specifically when we're exercising, it gets better. You know, I've always said if, if you felt the same way initially with shortness of breath as you did when someone who is having chest pain, people who have chest pain know something's wrong, and they will seek that medical mm-hmm. treatment. But with shortness of breath, we think, ah, I'm getting a little bit older. I haven't been exercising. I'm out of shape. So they contribute it to something else, a small element of denial there probably as well. But um, they wait until, you know, they have pretty significant problems and reduction in their lung function before they actually seek medical help. Okay, they do seek medical help. Now, we know we have a problem. We come to you. Where do we begin with treatment? Well, um, actually, they they determined that about – um, there's about 50% lung reduction by the time people actually go to see a physician. So we should try but, to go earlier, uh, That's course. right. As soon as you start to have any symptoms where you're more short of breath than you think you should be, or a chronic cough, we all cough every now and again. But if you have a cough on a daily basis and produce mucus during that time period, that is not normal. And the earlier we can intervene with the breathing problem, the um, we can try to halt its progression or slow down its progression. How do you basically. do that? So when you go to see the doctor and you tell the doctor that you're short of breath, there are some things that the physician will do. Of course, there's going to be the physical examination. Um, he or she will listen to the lungs. They will question you a lot about your history. Do you smoke? Did you work in an environment you know that could cause any irritation to the lungs? They will do generally blood work. They'll do a chest X-ray. Um, Of course, they're looking for different things when they do a chest X-ray, but there are um, significant changes that can occur. They can see when it's progressed emphysema within um, the chest X-ray. They can see something that's called hyperinflation. And with one of the key things in COPD being the fact that we have air trapping or keeping too much of that old air in there, the lungs stay overexpanded, and that will show up on an X-ray. Also, the main muscle for breathing, the diaphragm, um, should have a curve in it, but it becomes a little bit flattened when someone has COPD, and that can show up on an X-ray as well. That's also one of the things that contributes to the shortness of breath because the respiratory muscles aren't working in the way that they should be. But they will also do something that's called spirometry or pulmonary function testing, and that will definitely help with the diagnosis because... When they do this breathing test, there's several things that are involved, but basically they have them take a great big breath in and blow out all that air. And when they do that, they have a set of normals based on someone's age, grouping, height, and whether they're male or female, and they have a set of normals. They will compare those um, volumes and flows that you're performing to that set of normals to see if there um, is any involvement with the lungs and if there's reduction. When there is reduction in those numbers, you can pretty much make sure that you have COPD. They reproduce that. They don't have you do it just one time, you know, in case you hadn't taken in as big a breath or whatever. They need to make sure that you have several trials that are within a certain percent of each other so that they know that those are accurate. So we have it. And can we reverse it? Most of the breathing difficulties are not reversible. Basically, what we're wanting to do is slow down the progression and help with the symptoms. Um, There are medications that are out on the market now. Some of those therapies are bronchodilator therapies that help keep the airways a little more open. Um, Also, some steroid or anti-inflammatory type medications that decrease the swelling within the airways. And the combination of those medications helps keep the airways more open so that we can get more air in and out. Um, It's important to get a flu vaccine and also a pneumonia vaccine because we need to keep the lungs and the body as healthy as we can. And then also um, pulmonary rehabilitation. 
um, which is a program that's designed specifically for people that have breathing difficulties to help them learn about their breathing problems, um, be able to perform their day-to-day activities with less shortness of breath, help strengthen the heart and the lungs, the breathing muscles, the leg muscles, so that they can do those activities feeling more comfortable with that. And this is what you do at the Richard Rosenbaum Pulmonary Rehabilitation Center. That is. Um, the Within the therapy itself, it's made up of, it's all done at the same time, but there's three basic components. And one is education. Because, as we talked about before, education is very important. No matter what age you know you are, it's very important to know as much as you can about um, the disease process that you have. If you know what is going on, it makes it a little bit easier for you to understand why we're asking you to do the things that we are, as well as the importance of the medication. Um, we want the individual to have control of what's going on, you know, with their disease process. So we teach them all about how the lungs work. We teach them about the medications that they're on, how to properly use their medications, because that can make a world of difference. Um, Panic is a big issue when people become short of breath. And we teach panic control techniques, uh, relaxation techniques, things to help them in in that respect. And if we are in rehab at Mm -hmm. the center... What kind of commitment is that? Uh, How often do we visit? It's two days a week and for anywhere between an hour to roughly an hour, 15 minutes, an hour and a half. It is very important to be committed and to be consistent with the therapy. Um, In addition to the educational aspect, we also do something that's called breathing retraining, where we're basically retraining or reteaching the breathing muscles to work the way they are. You know, we laugh at that, but I don't think you really realize that most of us breathe wrong. I went to to, uh, Pilates class and teaching you how to breathe from the rib cage rather than down below. It it takes some – you don't realize you're breathing wrong when you take in your deep breaths. Right, and and what ends up happening when people become short of breath – of course, they end up using a lot of upper chest muscles um, for breathing, and it's a very ineffective way to yeah. breathe. And so they're using more energy with the process of breathing, so that makes them more tired with certainly everything that they do. And because the breathing muscles are like other muscle fibers, they become weak when you don't use them, specifically the diaphragm, um, correctly. And, 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 we can, and we can work on using the diaphragm properly and strengthening that muscle as well. You are listening to Health Talk on WAJR, brought to you by Mon General Hospital. We'll be back right after this. The doctors, the latest news and procedures. Your local health connection is Mon General's Health Talk. If you'd like to be on the show, call 304-296-0041. Janet Ween, another step in pulmonary rehab that you wanted to mention. Um, the, the other part is the physical reconditioning, um, where we have individuals either walk at a slow, comfortable pace on the treadmill, which is gradually increased as they progress through the program. We also have exercise bicycles and something called a new step if someone's not able to walk comfortably on the treadmill. Um, we tend to use the treadmill when we can because we want to train individuals for what they need to do throughout their day-to-day life, which is walking. Um, the whole goal is to be able to perform your day-to-day activities, get a little more enjoyment out of life um, with the breathing problem that you have. We also do strength strengthening exercises using hand weights, leg weights, and we have a Nautilus system as well so that we can strengthen and train the other muscles of the body so that they're a little more efficient with their oxygen use. So if we've been a smoker, a coal miner, a farmer, worked in a foundry, had exposure to asbestos, how can we find out more about the uh, Rick Rosenbaum Pulmonary Rehab Center? Well, you can actually find out by giving us a call. The phone number is 304-598-2408. We are located at 200 Wedgwood Drive, Suite 105, which is in the Medical Arts Building. Um, You can call us. You can talk to your physician the next time that you would see them to see if you would be a candidate for the outpatient pulmonary rehab program. So if we have shortness of breath, have difficulty breathing, we should make the call. That, that is correct. And definitely speak to your doctor about the conditions that you're having. Thank you so much for being on the program with us today. Very informative and such a natural behind the microphone, too. Well, thank you. Uh, Janet Ween, our guest here on Health Talk, brought to you by Mon General Hospital every Thursday morning at 835. Stay with us on 1440 AM and at WHAR.com because Morgantown AM is coming up after.